Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we're so thankful that you hear our prayers and our petitions. We glorify your great name. And we thank you for your love, your truth to us from the scripture and from the life, death, and burial, resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. Thank you that Christ, who from eternity's past was truly God, stepped into time and became truly God, truly man, for us and our salvation. We are never, in any moment of life, are we ever, Lord, lacking the need for this truth of the gospel concerning your Son. It must ever be before us, the anchor, the foundation, the pillar, the comfort and the hope that encourages us. I pray in response to your love to us that we also would express our thanksgiving to you as we open up your word with a sense of honor and reverence for the sacred text. And that as our brother prayed earlier this morning, that our affections and our thoughts will be devoted to you that to read your word is to read the very words of our God, that you are also present in the scripture at all times, but you're also present in us by the Spirit. Christ who dwells in us, dwells in us richly as we grow in nearness to the truth that transforms us and conforms us into his image. We depend on your spirit to enable us. We have received this gift of the spirit in salvation. He applies the message of Christ to our life in sanctification. It is his light that gives to us the grace of illumination. It is his power that strengthens us for the goal of application. And it is the spirit of God who points us upward to give all praise and adoration to the Father and the Son. O oh God of heaven, let not one drop from heaven's truths this morning escape our thoughts and our affections and our engagement and draw us nearer to the word that the preacher and the people the slave who is a messenger for his master, the Lord Jesus Christ, will speak to fellow slaves in Christ the wonderful words of life. In the name of our most gloriously risen and ascended Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Well, dear saints, please turn with me to God's sacred and holy word to Psalm 119, the 119th Psalm. If, if there is a title for this psalm, it is the joy of God's word. But it is the joy of God's word in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation. It is the joy of God's word the struggles of life and, and sin. It is the joy of God's word in the presence of hostility and indifference because of the word of God. But this psalm is also filled with much grace and goodness from God. It is a psalmist who loves the word of God dearly, treasures the word of God deeply, and enjoys the word of God because it is from God himself. He loves the law, the instruction, the precepts, the commandments, the statutes. There's nothing about God's word that he does not find to be joyful. 
It is because of God. His love for the law is because of his love for God. It was Matthew Henry who commentated and quoted his father. His father, Philip Henry, said that all grace grows as love for the word of God grows. And of this Psalm 119, it was Jonathan Edwards who, I believe, said, I know of no part of the Holy Scriptures where the nature and evidence of true and sincere godliness are so fully and largely insisted on and delineated as in the 119th Psalm. It is indeed a Psalm of all Psalms. We looked at the first uh, three letters in the Hebrew alphabet because that is the heading for this psalm. You have 176 verses, uh, 22 outlines uh, based on the Hebrew alphabet. And the psalmist began by extolling the blessedness of those whose way is blameless, but notably who walk in the law of the Lord. You can call that, that first alphabet the blessing of reading and obeying God's word, the blessing of, of reading and obeying God's word. Who walk in it is a way of life. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. This means this act of sincerity. A whole heart means the entire person, the mind and the body, the body and the soul, the thinking and the doing. It is a, a full engagement in seeking God. It is not an, a statement of perfection. It is a statement of the totality of the person's commitment. And then it says, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. So there is in, in the very beginning this, this vertical relationship, but also the horizontal, the doing no wrong, is not just not sinning, but it's also in how uh, the worshiper responds to people and relationships around him. It is a blessing to have these virtues there, and it comes from the reading and the obeying of God's Word. And then in verses 9 through 16, the psalmist emphasizes purity and joy. Purity and joy. How is it possible to pursue godliness in this world, purity in this impure world? It, it is by guarding it. Not according to the disciplines of this world, but according the standard, the writing, the revelation of God's word. And then in verse 11, I have stored your word, and we talk about the importance of memorizing God's word, but it is not just the mental ability to refer to the text of Scripture, but the grace of God to apply that to the heart. I have stored it in my heart. And the purpose is that I might not sin against you. And then verses 17 through 24 there, I believe, is an emphasis on spiritual growth. On spiritual growth, it says, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. I do not think the psalmist is referring just to life in its natural sense. But I believe in reference to the word of God, it is spiritual vitality or spiritual endurance. A spiritual progress. Even in the opening of my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of your law, there's a dependency on the Spirit of God to illuminate him, to give him understanding. And we do know that we have the Spirit of God who resides within us. But I recall a quote many years ago by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Every time he approached the steps up to the pulpit, he would recite this phrase, I believe in the Holy Spirit. It is not that he did not believe the Holy Spirit dwelled within him and would enable him it was an affirmation of his total dependency on the Spirit of God. It is, not, it is not denying the present and active abiding work of the Spirit in the lives of those who are saved, 
In contrast, I believe, to the Old Testament saints where they were regenerated by the Holy Spirit. But our Savior and John made this promise to his disciples and also uh, to those who will believe after them that the Holy Spirit will not just be with them, but he will be in them. So we know the Holy Spirit is in us. But when we see this text, verse 18 and others, for example, when we, when we see the, the passages about giving life, it is a statement of dependency upon God. That we never rely on our abilities. We, we never rely on what we have acquired over the years, although that is important. You don't cast aside your learning, but what you do not do is you do not abandon your dependency upon God because you've acquired so much over the years. I would say that spiritual maturity bleeds a deeper dependency. The more you know, as they say, is the more you know you don't know. Well, there's that dependency upon the Spirit of God so that you may behold wondrous things out of the law. It's not just the the discipline of reading only, and that is a part of the process. But in, in mining the depths of the Scripture and in studying, you, you want to know more of these truths, these gems in the Scriptures that only come from the Spirit's grace of illumination and the discipline of study. And now verses 25 to 32 the psalmist is praying for spiritual renewal. He's praying for spiritual renewal. Verse 25, he says, My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. When I told of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. And the psalmist is referring to a clinging to the dust. It is an indication that something is lacking. There's, there's a famine. I'm also inclined to, to believe that the psalmist is not just struggling physically because he makes reference to his soul. So something is going on spiritually. Maybe the issues around him has had an effect on, on his response uh, to spiritual truths, that may be the case. But at the end of all of the struggles, it is a spiritual struggle. And he's asking for this renewing grace that God gives. Often he mentions this, this aspect of life. But once again, whether this is physical or spiritual, which I think the emphasis is spiritual, he's acknowledging that he needs God's help. It was our Savior who clearly stated that apart from me, you, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. The psalmist recognizes that spiritual growth, spiritual life, and vitality is a work of God's grace in the heart. Let me just say this. The, even the hunger for the Word of God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. It is a blessing. It is a gift of God's grace. This is not something that we want naturally. It is something that we desire supernaturally. So for the psalmist in the midst of all of the struggles and the opposition and, and the hatred, those around him, but also the battle uh, within him, for him to come to this point of acknowledging his need for God is a work of God's saving grace. Because only believers can come to God empty-handed. It is a gift of grace to know. As he says, his soul clings to the dust, and then in verse 28, it melts away for sorrow. And he says, strengthen me. It is to acknowledge, once again, it is, it is according to your word. It is from you, God. What he prays for here is what we do have, believers. We have this in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is a constant source of life. But this 
flourishes, this, the, the source of this life affecting the way that we live, the way that we think, it comes through this day-to-day -day cultivation of the Word of God and dependency. Dependency on Him. You also find that these petitions are in this particular text of Scripture. He's making these prayers to God, but he's totally dependent upon God. He's relying upon Him, trusting in Him. He says, make me understand, in verse 27, the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. There's a correlation between understanding the way of God's precepts or God's direction for life and, and meditation. There's this God giving, the psalmist receiving, and through that he grows. But you know what grows in understanding once more is dependency. Reliance on God. A daily acknowledgement of our need for God. My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. And then verse 29, he says, Put away false ways from me and graciously teach me your law. Well, the psalmist says what is false is either wrong or it has little value. It looks good. It looks appealing. It, 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 it looks pleasurable like sin is for a season. But it is of no eternal value. Sometimes it is used, that term false ways is used as a reference for the temporal. I do believe what the psalmist is saying here is that he does not want to cultivate a love for the things of this world. That's not what he wants. He doesn't want the allurement of this world. He doesn't want the, the, the enticements of this world to be his pleasure. This is almost our equivalence of putting off and putting on. What is stressed here is, is not the believer's role in it, but God's power in it. There's a, an acknowledgement of God's power to put these sins off, to put these desires off, to put these temptations away, to remove the appetite for these sensual desires. As the Apostle Paul reminded the believers that since we are now in Christ, what should we do with our affections? To, to set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. This is not at all saying that we ought not to be dutiful about our responsibilities in life and to enjoy the natural blessings that God gives to us in life. But as you work through this psalm, you realize that if we cling to these earthly possessions, we will no longer cling to God, Christ, and the Scripture. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, John says. So he says, love not the world, nor the things of the world. But well, the psalmist, as we should acknowledge, is the power comes from our fellowship with the risen Savior. It is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. That is the power that enables us to deal with the false ways and falling in love with the pleasures of this world. He says in verse 30, I, I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I, I set your rules before me. This verse 30 begins a, a series of commitments made on the psalmist's part. Verse 30, I've chosen. Verse 30, when I cling to. Verse 32, I will run. The way of faithfulness is not the psalmist's way of faithfulness. Well, the psalmist is acknowledging God's faithfulness. It is the way, it is, it is the path. The path of faithfulness, and there's only one path of faithfulness, it is God's path. And so, another way to say the way of faithfulness is that the psalmist 
has chosen God's word as his heading, his compass for life. He loves it. He finds great joy and pleasure in it. There's a constant reading of it, the regular meditation upon it. There is also the struggle over the word of God. You, you, you kind of, as you look at this, see that the psalmist sees God's word and he, he marvels in it, he glories in it, and he desires to obey it in principle. But his practice is not always consistent with that principle. But is he in despair? What does he do when he's in despair? What does he, what does he do when he's tempted to go into despair or to be discouraged? He, he goes back to the word of God. So it reminds us is the scriptures, when we're inconsistent, when we feel ineffective, when we do not feel worthy, when we do not think we can or should, when we look at our lives personally and it just, it just doesn't line up, you, you almost look at other believers and think that they are really super Christians. And you are this sub-Christian, reading a Bible in a, a sub, a lesser degree. You, you don't understand it. They, they are profound in how they articulate it. And, and when you read it, it's, it's like, like I, I see it, but I don't always get it. They seem to get it all the time. I'm just this sub-Christian. The psalmist doesn't live in that world. The world he lives in is, is God's word. That's what gives him hope when he sees his life. And dear saints, that is so important and precious to us as saints. I said last week, there is the ideal. There's the absolute God's word. And then here we are, not ideal, not absolute. That's our life. It is God's word we turn to when those absolutes we love are not necessarily having the same effect we desire for it to have in our lives. We turn to the word of God. And it says, I've chosen the way of faithfulness, not because I'm always faithful, but because you, even when I am faithless, God, you remain faithful. You cannot deny yourself. The psalmist chose the way of faithfulness because that's where God is. And so when he falls into sin and he's overcome by the world and he knows he ought not to be. And this sense it is true, we ought not to be overcome by the affairs of this world, but let's be honest, watch the news long enough and you will be overcome by it. See enough of the cruelty in the world around you and it will get a hold of you, it will affect you. Then not to mention your seesaw life spiritually, that can get a hold of you. Well, what do you do? You look at a faithful God, a merciful God, a gracious God, a loving God, a compassionate God. And where do you find all of that in the scripture? You know, that is why meditation is so important, but, but memorization with a meditation or find a way to capture the truth in your mind and in your heart to really practice the word of God. So that when these moments come, you, you start forgetting more of yourself and remember more of your Savior. This faithfulness, Lord, dear saints, in verse 30 stands in contrast to the false ways in Verse 29, whatever is, is not consistent with the character, the nature, the goodness, the word of God, it is false. If it is contradictory to what God says, it is false. It is irrelevant who speaks it, whatever authority they speak it from, whatever platform they speak on. Whatever is false, temporal, sinful, he says, I've chosen what is faithful, what is lasting, what is eternal, and it is the word of God. The word of God is eternal. It is unfading. So he holds fast to it because it is the very words of God.
that spiritual renewal. And then in verses 33 to 40, there is this sense of humility. There's humility here in this text. There are seven or maybe even eight, they would call them imperatives here, but we know that no one can command God or demand anything from God. But they're called imperatives here because of the sense of urgency. But let me repeat dependency. He knows that these requests, these urgent appeals to God, only God can supply. So he says, teach me. Give me. It's not like, you know, when you, when you think of the word give me by itself, it just sounds like a spoiled child. No, give me. It's give me understanding. It's, it's a psalmist who's asking of God with confidence. It's like, I, I will receive none of this apart from you. Lead me. And then he says, incline my heart. Turn my eyes. Verse 33, teach me. Verse 34, give me. Verse 35, lead me. Verse 36, incline my heart. Verse 37, turn my eyes. Verse 38, confirm. Verse 39, turn away. And if we look at verse 40, the end of it, give me life. And there is a level of humility. Teach me. It's an attitude of humility because you know it's not easy for all of us to learn or to be taught. The I know it, the I got it, I want to do it myself attitude. You know, I've, I have children. I, I want, almost want to say I had children. They're adults now. And yes, you know, I, those of you, I have a grandson. So we, we all know how challenging it can be to teach. Well, do we have to look outside of us to come to that recognition? No, we just need a mirror. And there you see that reflection. See, why do you think in jobs you need 90 days to six months to learn? I always say the more submitted we are in learning, the faster we learn. But there's always just this, this disposition of, of the heart. And it's, it's sinful. And it is nothing wrong with trying to figure things out our way, but just, I want to not just figure it out, I want to do it my way. And you wrestle with that. You read the company's rules and regulations, and, and truly, maybe you're looking for what you don't agree with as opposed to realizing that they are a God-given authority over you. And your job is not to read and scrutinize what you don't like, but to read and submit to what is right and what is good for that job, for that company, for, for those who you serve in that work sphere. So to say, teach me like this, is an act of humility. But this only comes in salvation. This only comes as a gift. Humility, you know this, is a gift. Pride is our vice. We're naturally born with a sinful pride. It is a supernatural gift of grace for us to humbly go before God or even before other believers and say, I need to learn, I need to grow, I need to mature. So as he's saying all of this, teach me, O Yahweh, the way of your statutes. We noted that the word statutes is about 21 times in the psalm. It could be a reference to God's decrees, his, his ordinances, his commands. So it could be an all-encompassing or holistic way of just saying, teach me everything about you, God, and your expectation of your saint. And he says, and I will keep it. I will keep it to the end. The point is that he's most likely referring to, I am going to keep this 
continually, that's one way of looking at it, others would propose that this means he's saying that this is an eternal reward. It's an eternal reward that when God teaches, you've thought about that, right? That when God teaches you, because he is eternal, his words are eternal, it means that when you learn spiritual lessons from God's word, it is not only profitable for this life. First Timothy chapter 4, Paul says this, that bodily exercise is of some or little profit. But he says spiritual discipline is profitable not only for this life, but the life to come. Now, dear saints, we don't have a lot of time in this world, right? We don't have enough time in the day. A third of it is spent most likely sleeping. Another tenth spent taking a nap. So there isn't much left. And there is about 20% of it in traffic. And 80% at work. It's just, there's not much time. Then isn't it wise for the Christian to invest in eternity? Because everything you learn about God now is always profitable, now and eternally. Maybe I am the one who initiated some of this. I just don't know. I guess in the heart you want to take credit for the good and blame someone else for the bad. There it is. See that? See that? But I've observed watching cooking shows and for the most part, they tend to be okay until they start to introduce immoral family structures. Then after that, you just, well, you know, I just, I have to go. But it's amazing that they will spend hours and hours preparing a meal for a judge. And win, lose, or draw, they're satisfied with that judge. He said, at least I went and I, I did the best I could and I prepared a meal for him or for her and they liked it. But here, saints, we, we have an opportunity to run at the very feet of our master for eternal purposes. So now do you find that pleasure, that, that joy, that excitement, that satisfaction? I'm not saying this, it happens all the time. The joy of God's word comes from the joy of knowing Christ. The psalmist's joy for the word of God is centered on Yahweh. It's not centered on just words alone, but, but these are the very words of God. When I pour my soul, my thoughts into the study of God's word, I am acquainted with someone who's eternal and infinite and great, and that will carry over not only in this life, but the life to come. Of course, I am not saying that, hey, cooking, you know, 10 minutes in the kitchen, 30 seconds in the microwave, you know, 10 minutes in the car. Like, brothers, you ought not to spend all that time cleaning the vehicle. It's an idol. It's going to perish. And so you drive every Sunday and the rims are falling off and you got busted seats. If you lived in beer country, the beer would be happy because you have a happy meal all throughout the vehicle. No, we're not saying to deny those things. Because I do believe in caring for what you have as a stewardship. It's an act of worship. What you have, big or small, whether it's a bike or a home or a bedroom or a car, it is all a stewardship from God. But there's no greater stewardship than knowing that I've been entrusted with God's word. And it is eternal. It is everlasting. The psalmist, I do believe, is referring to this, keeping it to the end, that this is, this is a rewarding blessing. Teach me, and I will keep it. I will treasure it, because it is eternal. It is eternal. These are all petitions. These are all prayers. 
as we pray, we can give God thanks for instructing us, for giving us understanding, but also we can pray for this same dependency upon the Lord, this same reliance on Him. Because we face similar challenges like verse 37. He says, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things. So he's not immune to the temptations of this world. He's not immune to the material enticements of this world. Just a few minutes before the service, I had to run an errand. And you know, I'm not exactly going and looking for illustrations as I go, but sometimes they jump out at you when you think about possessions. I was thinking about material possessions. And lo and behold, they're saints. The lottery was like at six something million dollars, 607 million. You're like, well, Pastor, how do you know the exact number? I don't, I was just guessing it. And you're looking at $607 million. The psalmist also realized that the quick and swift success of the lottery came at the cost of someone's livelihood. It robs a family, and the husband thinks, if I get this, I will be successful, the family will be okay, and he continues to do it week by week. Bills are not being paid, the car note's not being paid, the house note's not being paid, the groceries look slimmer and slimmer by the week. Yes, there's an integrity to realize that it is not just about the number and it's their fault, it is accountability to God. I, I will not pursue anything that is sinful and that came at the livelihood and the cost in the life of another. You say, well, someone else is going to do it if I don't. Once more, this is why it is a prayer. Because, oh, wow, dear saints, $600 million, a building fund is taken care of. Uh, you, you, you have all those thoughts, you know, I, I can buy the church a building. No, you ain't going to buy the church nothing. You, you just sell it. I'll, I'll pay this, or I'll take care of that person. You're not going to do any of that stuff. And by the time Uncle Sam shakes your hand, and your first, second, and 99th cousin comes your way, you will be broke, deceived, and to cheat. Now, that may not be your temptation, nor am I saying it is mine. It just makes me think. It is important to pray those prayers. Because whenever we pursue anything at the cost of someone's life or livelihood, it is not following the path of God. Well, the psalmist also acknowledges I do perceive as he speaks of this, that there's a reference point to his struggles. That, yeah, I am tempted to look at things that are of no eternal value at all. And I will pursue them recklessly apart from God's help. Apart from God's help. There's humility there. There's humility to acknowledge, yeah, yeah, I've seen those numbers before. And all of a sudden, my car pulled up in a 7-Eleven. I don't know what got a hold of me, but in my hands, I came this idol like the calf from the fire. And your golden car was in your wallet or your purse. It takes humility to recognize that, yes, I, I do pursue worthless things. I don't have eternity as my objective all the time. But dear saints, you must see these struggles and these issues within the framework of redemption. That is, I think, one of the blessings of being transparent with our sins. It's that all my sins are forgiven. I, I want to deal with them appropriately. I want to pursue sanctification. This is... This is this is not a condemned man. But remember, 
the scripture says there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. But it didn't say there is now therefore no consequences to those who are in Christ. So there's the burden of his sin as he works with this psalm. There, the, the burden is there. But he knows the burden is not lifted by doing anything right. It is lifted by the truth concerning the word of God. And for us, it's the truth concerning Christ. It's humility. Teach me, give me, lead me, incline my heart, turn my eyes, confirm to your servant, turn away, and, and then give me life. Once more, this is not just I want to live. Oh, I know that spiritual zest and zeal and fervor and strength comes not from me, but from you. Uh, verses 33 to 40, humility. 25 to 32, spiritual renewal. 17 to 24, spiritual growth. A 9 through 16, purity and joy. 1 through 8, the blessing of reading and obeying. And then verses 41 to 48. I believe that I would say that the word gives us hope. There is hope. It says in verse 41, Let your steadfast love come to me, O Yahweh, your salvation, according to your promise. Then shall I have an answer for him who taunts me, for I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your rules. I will keep your law continually forever and ever, and I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. I will also speak of your testimony before kings, and shall not be put to shame, for I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. The psalmist, once again, this is his continuing appeal or his prayer to God's steadfast or, or loyal love. And then he concludes verse 40, which he says, God's commandment, he lifts his hands as an act of worship towards God's commandment, which he loves and meditates on his statutes. But then he makes a reference to those who taunt him. They're, they're mockers, they're ridiculing him. But you notice why. Their attack, their criticism, has to do with his confidence and trust in the absolute, authoritative, binding, infallible, inspired, eternal word of God. Now, if there are any kinks thrown into the armor of that statement that I made, the world will receive it. There have been many great men who would cast dispersion or shadow on some elements of the scripture, and the world will receive that. But don't say I uphold every text of scripture from Genesis to Revelation because it is the very words of God. And if God said, it only took me six days, then it only took God six days. If Christ says he's going to return, then Christ is going to return. There's the genesis of, of believing the truth and the revelation. The book ends of this one single book. Well, the world continues, as we know, to, to hurl, hurl insults and, and criticisms. And sadly, over the years, the church continues to wane over these truths because we don't want to, quote, look bad or be embarrassed because of the ever-changing, slippery slope of science. That is science without its creator. The psalmist is asking for God's steadfast love, God to secure him as he promised to do so, 
Then he says, I shall have an answer for him who taunts me, for I trust in your word. He has confidence that when he stands before his accusers, his criticizers, that God will be with him. I trust. And he says, and take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your rules. This is an addition to his request in the steadfast love. He continues, I, I want your word to remain. Do not take it out of my mouth. You know, as we studied Ephesians chapter 6, Paul prayed, and he asked the saints to pray for him, that he might speak the things uh, as he ought to speak. And when he says he ought to speak, he's asking the saints to pray that God will speak through him. I believe there's a similar thought here in this psalm in verse 33. That the psalmist wants God's word, God's word to saturate his mind and also his speech. He doesn't want to be without God's word. He doesn't want to be abandoned on his own to draw from the text of scripture arbitrarily. He wants God to affect him so greatly that even as he speaks, whether it is before princes and, and kings or just everyday people, that God's word and God's spirit will be with him. Because he has great hope in God's word. He says, I will keep your law continually forever and ever. And I shall walk in a wide place for I've sought your precepts. This wide place, I do believe, has a reference. It's referring to wisdom. Or some would argue that the psalmist is saying that the scripture is not restricting him. It's not constrictive. It's not like when you read the scripture, you, you're confined to some rigid rules and regulations. That's not at all what he's thinking here. He believed that there's great freedom as a result of knowing the word of God. Walking in a wide place is not mean that he's walking on the broad road, but he's walking with God's wisdom and he truly knows what it means to live and how to live in this world. You know, if we ever see the word of God as a, a bunch of do's and don'ts, then we fail to know who he is. It is not just a list of prohibitions and exhortations, it is a very revelation of God who we despise in our sin, who revealed himself to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is, it is the glory of God, the written word and the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory, glory of God. The psalmist, I believe, recognizes that, that there's freedom. Years ago when I was working for a company in in Florida, I was talking to a young man about my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then he just turned pale. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, I, he said, I used to be a Christian. And of course, I didn't go on down the list of the five pointers. I didn't do that at all and wasn't as familiar with it at that time. So I asked him why. He said, well, it just seemed so hard because the Bible turned out to be a list of do's and don'ts. No, it's, it's a revelation of the glories of our God. And when you read the scripture through the lenses of salvation, as the Old Testament believers did, or through the lenses of Christ, you see the glory of God. The only people in this world who really know how to live without tripping over their feet every time are believers. Only the Christian. There are times when unbelievers, in the mercy of God, take a, make a few good decisions and a few good steps, but their steps are not ordered by God in their sin. Our steps ordered by God, and the order is the word of God. Well, the psalmist finds the word of God to be so, so encouraging that he can say this in verse 46, I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame. Why? For I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. It's one thing for you to, to speak 
of someone that you passively think is okay. But the reason why the psalmist loves the word of God is because he loves the God of the word. And he loves God because God first loved him. It is a response to God's initiative of love, but he loves God's commandments because he loves God. So whether or not you stand before great people, just imagine standing before in our, in our world, in our nation, before the president. The psalmist is not going to say, President, can I pray for you? And he might, but he's not just going to do that. He's going to give the president the gospel. He's going to tell that old Prezi, say, look, Prezi, I love you, I respect you, you're the leader of our nation. But even the POTUS has to bow the knee to the Messiah. In all of your pride and all of your arrogance and your pomp and circumstance, this is not about the office as about your need to repent and believe the gospel. I am not here as a man looking for financial and economic help from your hand. My help comes from the Lord. I am saying that you're in desperate need of salvation and that the only hope for salvation is in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not here to give you platitudes, which so many have. They'll go to him and, and they'll say all these great things. Oh, you've helped our nation, helped our economy. The churches are better because of you being in the office. But yet you're perishing in your sin. The repentant belief, you say, well, that's not going to help the church. Um, hmm. The psalmist says, I will also speak of your testimony before kings that shall not be put to shame because of his delight in God's word. It is to display the joy, the delight, and the confidence. That's why Paul says that I am, what, not a Shamed of the gospel. Why? He says, for the gospel, the good news is the power of God unto salvation. One of the nuances of this word of not being ashamed is that he believes that the gospel or the word of God will always achieve the same results that God purposed before he penned it through his authors. There was never a moment he doubted that. Now, there'd be moments of doubt and saying, well, what's going to come out of this? You know, will I die? Will I live? I make the headline news as this foolish guy who stood before the president and preached to him as opposed to bowing to his knee. No, it was, that was never the determining factor. Those thoughts may have been there. Paul said that in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, that at times he even despaired for life. So here's the great apostle who had moments of what? Fear. Paul was not sinless. But also he said that this, these events happen, these trials, these moments of despair happen so that we will not have confidence in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. The psalmist finds great delight, great joy, so the audience is irrelevant. He's not going to change the message to fit the audience. He delights so much in the Word of God, he's also prayed that the Word of God will always be in his mouth so that when he speaks, he speaks the very words of God. He doesn't trim it, doesn't adjust it. Okay, maybe you're not before kings. You may not be before the president. But just look at your daily life before the ordinary citizen who seems ordinary but important to God. The psalmist says the whole earth is filled with God's steadfast love. There's, there's a mercy of God over all his creation. So there's a love that God shows even toward the unbeliever. 
So when you stand and speak to them, do you trim the fat off the gospel? Do you trim the layers that may offend? And we ask, so what, what, what did you do yesterday? He said, well, I had a great time with some very close people. Can you say, yesterday I had a great time with God's people. We sang great songs. You know, the preacher, he did okay, but at least he read the scripture, and that's all I needed. I was edified. I was, I was built up. I was, I was encouraged. I was challenged. And then, you know what happened? I, I remembered, as I needed to remember, that I have a loving God who cared for me so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And that I don't have to dwell and, and, and live in, in condemnation or guilt over my sin. I have a sin bearer. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you know what happened is that I have a confidence in the word of God, even when the world says I ought not to. I have a love for the scripture because God has given me a love for the word. That's, that's what the psalmist would do. He doesn't want abbreviated spirituality. He wants to speak the very words of God. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul as he was going from synagogue to synagogue. Paul was looking for opportunities. You don't have to go to a synagogue to look for opportunities. Those opportunities are before you day by day, whether there's any office, the clinic, the job, the, the line, the grocery line. You're looking for those opportunities to declare the meat of God's goodness in the person of Christ. And know that there is absolutely no need to be ashamed because the good news is God's power. There is such great delight, this, this love of hope, this, this level of confidence in the word of God, he's resolved that I am not ashamed of this good news. And then in verse 48, he says, I, I will lift up my hands toward your commandments. This obviously pictures the psalmist praying to Yahweh. This is an expression of thanksgiving. This is in the context of worship, which means the lifting of the hands is another appropriate response. Now, it ought not to be forced. But just take comfort, dear saints, if you do lift your hands up in corporate worship at this fellowship, it's okay. It is a response. We all respond differently. But worship does evoke a response. As I said, this, I believe, is in a form of prayer, but it's in a posture of thanksgiving to God. For his word. And the psalmist finds that whether it is God describing something that he's done, the indicative, or God commanding something for us to do, he finds it to be all delightful and glorious. Why? It comes from God. It comes from God. Well, you know, what makes anyone love God's commandment? Love his word. It's the spirit of God. Uh, but I would say, though, this love, it needs cultivating. If you ever feel discouraged that you don't think you love the word of God as you should or you don't love it as often as you should, just what I want to tell you is that do not despair over that. Be honest. Be honest. But don't despair, but be honest. We all have moments and sometimes seasons. And then you go to bed at night and you have all the tension in the morning and you have all those thoughts in the morning 
you wake up and whatever thoughts you have are gone. You're sprinting just to make things work out. Now, I'm not trying to impose anything on you, but to get you to think. In those moments, what's more important? The bagel or the Bible? My dear saints, no one has ever died missing a meal. But many a people suffer from spiritual famine by missing this meal. I would also encourage you to remember what the psalmist did. In, in our moments of weakness, we can go to God. Acknowledge it's there. Claim his promises, yes, but petition for the grace that he's given us to trust in him to grow. To trust in him to grow. To cultivate a love for this word. I will say one more very important truth, and it is that we cannot, we cannot ignore the reality that the psalmist experiences here. This is not some type of lofty, Christian life, it's, it's not always working out. It's not always looking beautiful. He's not saying, well, look at my life, isn't it beautiful? No, he, he sees his life, he sees the issues, he sees the struggle. He's committed, it's truth. He's dedicated. He's going to keep God's word, but he knows there's moments when. He says in this text that he needed the affliction because before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. He knows that going astray is not just possible, it is probable. It's not just probable, it will happen. But you cling fast to his faithfulness, not yours, his goodness, not yours. You cling to the mercy of God, to the person of Christ. You cling to the hope of your salvation that is freely given, nothing earned. So you can make those honest assessments and evaluations of your life confidently because you've never rested in your deeds but you've rested in the work of Christ for you. This is a critical encouragement for us saints as we, we see our love for the word of God wane. It doesn't always have the flesh that we want. It doesn't always have the substance that we want. We, we must remember that we are weak. Our eternal life is secured in the Lord Jesus Christ. So making those honest confessions of sin and struggles and then going to God's word for help is the remedy. Not, not I got to do better. I had a brother saying that years ago. He says, I got to do better. I got to make it in. I'm like, brother, you will never make it in and you cannot do better to make it in. You, you, you need Christ. For, for those of us who are pursuing sanctification and Pursuing a love for the word of God, you, you need the spirit of God. It is okay to pray what you have and say, God, help me to apply the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit to hope in you. Grant to me the grace of humility to know that in my moments of weakness, it is necessary because it is your instrument to turn me to your word. Pray with me. We're so grateful for a God who's compassionate, who's good, whose word is true and we need never be ashamed of it. We can declare it to the world. Wherever you've placed us in our sphere of influence, of occupation, of work, our surrounding, we, 
we can always boldly proclaim the wonderful, glorious, good news of redemption that Christ came to save sinners, lived a life of absolute perfection in obedience to your divine law. So then he fulfilled the law's demand for us in his life. And then he fulfilled the law's demand in his sacrifice and atoning for our sins and bringing us to you. Now as your children, you're such a gracious teacher, such a compassionate instructor. And even in your correction, it is so good. And the reason why your correction is good is because you are good. And all that you do is for your glory and the good of your saints. Oh, grant to us the daily joy of the word, but when we find that we're in a place of famine, that we will look to you and the scriptures and remember that the source of our joy comes from you and the instruction for rekindling that joy is found in the sacred text of Holy Writ. Whenever we're in despair, let us look to the finished work of Christ. And when we're struggling to put the time and to invest the quality time so that we can lay treasures in heaven as we grow to know you more, oh, may we cling to your compassion and trust in you for the grace and the endurance to put away what we normally would do, whether it's television or a meal or recreation, and says, I, I, no, I must feast on this eternal meal. For in comparison to the eternal uh, truths of God's word, these activities are worthless. And may we see the, the wide path of your word, not in the way of compromise, but it is truly living without sins and encumbrances and uh, without the world's oppressive ideologies and the pressures of our own indwelling sin that is your word that leads us to a wide pasture of spiritual wealth and truth so that we can apply to every facet of life. What a marvel. What a treasure. What a pearl of great price is your word. May this river flow ever deeply in our hearts so that we will not spend time enduring disciplined reading of the word, but enjoying the depths of reading, studying, and meditating on the sacred text of our God. I ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our great high priest, our king, our savior, and Lord. Amen.